Hi everyone, my name is Gabe Tandy. In this video, we are going to create this grassland environment. We will cover topics such as using the path tracer inside of Unreal Engine, creating and animating a camera inside of Sequencer, and learning how to create, place, and render foliage so that it looks realistic. Now before diving deeper into this tutorial, I want to briefly touch on the software that I used to make this environment. I used Unreal Engine, Gaia, Speedtree Games, and DaVinci Resolve. Of course, other software will work in place of the programs that I'm using. However, these are the tools that I feel comfortable with, but if you have something else in your pipeline, do feel free to use it. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that I was using Unreal Engine 5's Path Tracer. In this little segment, I want to go over what the Path Tracer is, why I use it, and how I use it. The Path Tracer is a rendering mode inside of Unreal. While it is not a real-time feature, it provides you with physically accurate global illumination, reflections, and refractions. The reason that I'm using it for this environment is because I have a lot of foliage in my scene. Just from my own trial and error, I have found that foliage rendered with a path tracer looks incredibly photorealistic. And the second reason is I'm getting physically correct shadows from my plants all the way into the far distance of my environment. It's all there right out of the box. When you open Unreal Engine 5, you will be prompted to create a new project. For this project, I'm going to use the film slash video template with the blank level. I'm also going to make sure ray tracing is enabled. Because the path tracer shares the same ray tracing architecture inside of Unreal Engine, ray tracing has to be enabled in order to use the path tracer. Of course, once our project is created, we can later go in and enable ray tracing, but I'm just going to do it at the start. Once I am in my project, I will delete all the default lights. I will then create my own using the environment light mixer. The next thing I'll do is I'll go into my place actors tab and add a post process volume. The first thing I want to do inside of my post process volume is fix my exposure. And the way that we're going to do that is we are going to clamp my exposure values. What I will do is type in exposure and clamp the min and max to a value of 1. Next, we need to make sure that infinite extend is enabled. If we do not check infinite extend, the post process volume will only apply to our scene when we are inside of it. So to fix that, I'm just going to type in infinite and it up pops infinite extend. And when I check that box, you can see that the post process volume is being applied to the entire scene regardless of if I'm inside the post process volume. After our basic lighting has been established, it's time to start creating our terrain. For this process, I'm going to use a program called Gaia. However, you can still make very believable trains inside of Unreal Engine. Tools such as the Landmass plugin or landscape brushes can quickly give you realistic landscapes that you can iterate on throughout your project. Before heading into Gaia, I'm going to go over my reference. You can see that the terrain here is quite smooth, and the main source of erosion comes from creeks and rivers that go through the terrain. The terrain that I created inside of Gaia for the Grasslands project is very, very simple. I first started with a Perla noise to get my base shapes. From there, I added a river node to act as my main source of erosion. I then sharpened up the terrain with a thermal shaper, then extracted masks from my terrain, such as this growth mask, this flow mask, and this arboreal mask. Now, this arboreal node is new to Gaia. It simulates the placement of trees and shrubs on your terrain. I'm using this node in this situation to generate a mask for my material. So later on, when I go to paint my trees on my terrain, I can use the mask from this node as a base color for use inside my landscape master material. More on this later. Lastly, I'll export all of my textures as PNGs for use in Unreal. Once our terrain has been exported from Gaia, it's time to bring it into Unreal. I'm going to go into my landscape mode and import the height map from Gaia. Once the map has been loaded, it's time to properly scale our terrain. Going back to Gaia, you can see that the height of our terrain is 2600 and the scale is 5000. This information is important because in Unreal, one meter is represented by one pixel. So in order to scale our terrain properly, we need to multiply our terrain by 5000 and then divide it by our height map resolution, which is 4033. For our Z axis, we need to multiply it by 2600, then divide it by 512. 
and that will properly match the scale of our terrain from Gaia. The next step in our terrain process is creating the master material that we will apply to this terrain. My landscape master material is kept very, very simple. The base color of it is driven by three constant threes lerped together using the masks that we generated from Gaia. I have a landscape coordinate node with the correct size of my landscape plugged into the UV channel of my masks so that they are mapped onto the terrain properly. At the very end, I have a static switch parameter that allows me to swap between my base color and my arboreal tree mask that I will use later on when painting my trees. My roughness is being driven by a Megascans texture, plugged into a multiply and a constant to control the intensity, then a texture coordinate with a very small value is plugged into the UV channel to control the tiling. And lastly, my normals are also driven by a Megascans texture, tiled across my landscape. I then have it plugged into a flat normal, a one minus, and a constant to control its intensity. Once our material has been applied to our landscape, I'm going to create a cine camera and piloting my camera, I'm going to fly around my scene looking for a pleasing composition. Once I find a composition that I like, I'm going to bring a mannequin into the scene. Now a mannequin is very important because it helps you with the sense of scale in your scene and later on in the process when we go to start painting our foliage, it'll help us determine how large or how small our foliage should be. Before we start painting our foliage, I wanted to quickly show the trees that I made inside of Speed Tree. Going through this tree, it is in fact very simple. A quick disclaimer, I made this tree based off a tutorial by a man named Daniel Perez. You can find the link to his tutorial in the description down below. Looking at the main tree itself, it's very, very simple. You just have a main trunk with some branches coming off of it and then some dead branches towards the bottom. One valuable thing that I've started using inside of Speedtree is using reference. You can see that I just downloaded a image from Google, brought it into Photoshop, convert it to black and white, and then brought it in as a leaf mesh. And I use this reference image just as a silhouette to build my tree off of. Once I have the initial shape of my tree done, I will add in my leaf cards. Each one of these leaf cards was made inside of Speedtree in a different project file. Speedtree has some good tutorials as well as a Daniel's tutorial on how to create these uh, leaf clusters like you see here. So I'm not going to dive super into it because I don't want to steal Daniel's thunder, but that's a great resource if you guys want to learn more about creating foliage inside of Speedtree. The rest of my foliage that I will be using comes from Quixel Megascans. For now, I'm going to start painting my trees onto my landscape. I'm going to open up my material instance and toggle on my static switch parameter, which will then display the tree mask that we got from Gaia. From here, I will go into the foliage mode and add my pine trees. So this process usually takes some trial and error trying to find the correct size and density of your trees. As a general rule of thumb, pine trees are at least in the setting that I'm painting them, generally around the same size. So for the min value, which is how small the pine trees can be, I'm going to do 0.8. And for the max, which is how large the pine trees can be, I'm going to do 1.1. And this is just the scaling value if we just go and do some painting. Now you can see my paint density is way too high. So instead, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn down my paint density to 0.1 and see what that looks like. That's still incredibly high. So I'll go down to my secondary density and turn that down to say a value of one. And that looks a lot better. Going into our cine camera, I'm going to move this foliage tab off screen for the time being. I'm going to start painting down my trees and I can see just from my cine camera the area that I need to paint down my trees. So my first painting of these trees is not going to be super dense because I don't want to paint down more trees than I absolutely need. So you can see right here, the trees look quite good, but I think I could turn the density down a bit more. So now it's just a dance. I'll paint down some trees, I'll go back into my camera and check, then I'll paint some trees, then go back into my camera and check, and I will just continue this process until I've painted down all of my trees and I'm happy with how they look. Now an important thing to note, because we're designing this scene with gameplay not in mind, 
is purely for cinematics. I'm going to push the visual fidelity of my scene quite high, which will result in low FPS numbers. This is just something you need to be aware of, and I will in fact toggle on my FPS right here so you guys can see it. I'm guessing that at the end of this project, it'll be around 10 FPS. For my way of thinking, as long as the scene looks photorealistic and it looks beautiful, the FPS does not matter in this case. Once I'm happy with my trees, I'm going to turn off my tree mask and go back to my normal base color. Now it is time to start painting our grass. Before we begin our painting, I'm going to quickly change out the material in the foreground. You can see right now that the landscape master material is quite atrocious when viewed from this close of a distance. It's more so meant to be viewed from afar. So what we will do is we will go into the landscape mode and in here we can click on manage and we can select little quadrants of our landscape that we want to apply a material to. So what I will do is I will jump into my cine camera and select each quadrant until I am happy with all the quadrants that I have selected, which these this amount looks okay. And then what I can do is I can go over here to this override material and apply whatever material I want to. In this case, I have a Megascans material that I am going to apply, and you can see that it is now applied to these quadrants on our landscape. For any of you guys that are wondering, the foliage, because it shares the ray tracing architecture, it actually culls foliage over a certain distance. So to prevent that, there is a helpful console command, um, like the one right here. I'll put it down in the description of this video so you guys can just copy and paste it. It's a value of zero and that will prevent your foliage from being culled away. For my grasses, what I usually like to do is paint the smaller grasses first and then progressively paint larger and larger grasses. So for this base first pass, I'm going to paint down some Quicksilver Megascan grasses. For this scene, I'm using the wild grass. And because we still have this mannequin here, we can ensure that our plants are scaled to the correct size. Once I'm happy with my plant selection, I'm going to increase the density of my plants and start painting them down. The path tracer does render foliage a little bit differently, so it's always important throughout this process to toggle on the path tracer and just check and see if the foliage is looking correct. Now is a good time to talk about termination lines when painting your foliage. Because you don't want your foliage stretching all the way out into the distance because one, you won't get good performance in your scene and two, it won't add any extra detail to justify the poor performance that you'll experience for the rest of your project. You need to find good termination points to end your foliage. For instance, with my scene, after the crest of this hill, the foliage is not even visible. So this is where I'm choosing to terminate my foliage. Now that I'm happy with my base covering of foliage, I'm going to increase the size of my plants and go back over for a second pass to add some height variation. And an important thing to remember when painting foliage, as the size of the object increases, the frequency of it decreases. So as a general rule of thumb, smaller grasses will be more numerous throughout your scene, while larger grasses will be less numerous. This process is very, very similar to painting the trees. It's just trial and error. Once I'm happy with the grass in my scene, I'm gonna start painting some shrubs and some bushes throughout. It's also important during this step to consult with your reference. Look at how plants are clustered, figure out what species of plants grow in your environment, where they grow, how they grow. All these little details are very important when recreating nature. Now that I'm happy with the foliage in my scene, I'm going to start tweaking my path tracer settings. You can notice that my progress display down here for my path tracer is moving along very, very slowly. And that's because my path tracer is set to a very, very high sample count. So for working in the scene, I'm gonna turn down the bounces to a number of about 12. I'm gonna turn my samples per pixel down to 150. And as you can see, it's rendering a lot faster now. The filter width, I find that a value of around 2.5 is what I prefer. Uh, play around with this value and see how you like it, but but basically the filter width uh, sets the anti-aliasing for the path tracer. So a smaller the number, the sharper the anti-aliasing will be, and the higher the number, the more blurry your scene will be. The reference depth of field is a high quality depth of field mode that you can access with the path tracer. It looks very, very nice. And lastly, I'm going to disable the denoiser. For these foliage scenes, the denoiser will only cause problems. Because of how fine foliage is, the denoiser will recognize the fine leaves and needles of these grasses or the pine trees 
and it will interpret those fine objects as noise and it will blur them together and it will not look appealing at all. So I would highly recommend turning off your denoiser. The last step is matching the base color of our terrain to our foliage. Because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to sell the effect that the foliage is going all the way into the distance when in reality it's not. This process too is also very much trial and error. Oftentimes what I'll do is I'll swap to the unlit mode so I can go in and I can sample the colors when there's no lighting affecting them. And another thing that we can do is we can bump up the intensity of our normal so that we can see it clear. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mess with the normal intensity and the tiling of the normal until the normal map can somewhat look like the grass here in the foreground. This too is another process that is just trial and error. However, I think this is at a good place for now and I'll probably end up tweaking this a bit more once the lighting of my scene is at a point that I'm happy with. For this scene, a large part of my lighting will be made up from my HDRI. Now, the HDRI material that I made up is quite simple. I have a constant three, two constants, and an absolute world position plugged into a rotate about axis with an add and a normalize node all plugged into my textures UV channel. Now what these nodes do here is they control my rotation of my HDRI on a sphere. And these nodes here are from the Quixel Megascans master material. And all they do is they allow me to change the saturation, the brightness, the contrast, and the albedo tint of my HDRI texture. My material itself is set to unlit and two-sided. Next, I'm going to go and I'm going to add a sphere to my scene and scale it up to where it is large enough to cover my entire environment. Now that my sphere is covering my entire environment, I'm going to add my HDRI material to it. And lastly, you need to go under your sphere and type in cast shadows and make sure cast shadows is disabled. From here, I'm going to go in and disable my directional light, my sky atmosphere and my skylight. Then I'm going to toggle on my path tracer. Now you can see that the path tracer still works even without a skylight. Now I'm not sure the exact science behind this, but to my understanding, depending on how bright your HDRI material is, I have found in some of my scenes that I haven't even needed a skylight. Next, I'm going to go into my material instance and mess around with the rotation of my HDRI until I find something that I like. Now that I have something that looks pretty good, I'm gonna turn back on my directional light, my sky atmosphere, and my skylight. I'm then going to exit my cine camera and I'm going to align my directional light with the sun from the HDRI. Once they're both aligned, I'm going to go back into my camera and my path tracer and see how it all looks. I think I'm going to also experiment around with, with some different HDRI textures just to see what I can get. This lighting looks okay, however it's a bit too yellow for me. So I think I'm going to mess around with the angle of my directional light a little bit, close enough to the origin of my HDRI sunlight so it doesn't seem completely off, but enough to where hopefully I can achieve some more pleasing lighting on my landscape. Now with this lighting, it's already looking so much better. I'm getting a lot more contrast and highlights in my plants. I have deep shadows stretching over my terrain. It's looking really, really nice. Now, one thing you're probably noticing is all these fireflies. Now, this is a result of the path tracer, and I don't know exactly the math behind why these fireflies appear, but one thing that we can do is inside our post-process volume, inside our path tracing settings, we can turn our max path exposure down to a value of about 10. And 10 might still be too high, so I'm gonna try five. And we're still getting some fireflies, so I'm gonna try three. And three looks like it should do the trick. So I've done some more set dressing in my environment and I'm happy with the results. At this point, I'm going to head into my post-process volume and do some basic color correcting to my scene before rendering and bringing it into DaVinci Resolve. I'm going to go into my post-process volume, collapse my lens, and right here you can see color grading. So this step, I'm gonna go by what kind of feel is right. I'm going to start by adjusting my white balance. I'm also gonna turn down my saturation ever so slightly. I'm going to lift the gain of my scene a little bit just to make it a smidge brighter. And I don't believe that I'm going to touch any of my film settings such as my slope, my toe, or my shoulder. Cool. And that's all the color grading that I am going to do. Now that my color grading is at a point that I like, it's time to create a animation sequence, add our camera to it, and animate our camera. So the first step is creating our animation sequence. I'm going to right click, 
find animation and go down to level sequence. And I'm going to name this such as, uh, say, camera one. From there, I'm going to open it up and add my cine camera to it. Now you'll notice that while I've been working, I've had my cine camera locked. That way I can't accidentally move my camera. In order to unlock it, I'm gonna right click, go to transform and uncheck lock actor movement. Now the initial idea I have for this camera sequence is to have the camera start pretty low towards the ground and then slowly move up, thus revealing the rest of the environment. Go into my camera, click on it and move it down a little bit. Something about right here. Now, for now, I'm just going to keyframe my location and my rotation. Then I'm going to change my FPS from 30 to 24. 24 is more cinematic and it's also less frames that we have to render out. I know I want my sequence to be around 10 to 12 seconds long. So 10 times 24 is 240. So I'm going to type in just 300 here, which is the the span of my timeline, and then these brackets control how long my animation actually is. And I'm gonna move this one to 240. So now we have a 10 second long animation. I'm gonna to go to the end of my animation, and I'm going to make sure that I'm on a very, very low speed. And I'm going to just move my camera up ever so slightly and then keyframe my location and my rotation again. Now let's see what that looks like. There we go. We can see that our camera is now moving upwards. Now that's not too bad, but it's pretty lackluster. So to spice things up, I'm gonna add some camera shake. So in order to create our camera shake, we're gonna go back into our content browser, right click and select blueprint class. From here, we're gonna to toggle this down and we're gonna type in shake. And then select camera shake base. And then I'm gonna name this shake01. We can double click to open this blueprint and up pops our typical event graph. You want to close down this window and reopen it. And this gives you a new UI, which is easier to work with. From here, we're gonna go back into our sequencer. We're then gonna click on track camera shake and add our shake. You can see it's right here. We're gonna move this over to the entire course of our timeline. Now going back into our blueprint, under the root shake pattern, we're gonna choose Perlin noise. And then toggling this down, we can now start tweaking our noise pattern. So first you wanna to go to timing and duration and turn the duration to zero. This means that the animation will loop indefinitely. Next, I'm gonna to head to my rotation and I'm gonna turn my rotation amplitude multiplier to a value of 0.1 just to start. What we can also do is we can toggle down the pitch, yaw, and roll and individually tweak these values. Now pitch makes our camera go forward and backward. Yaw makes our camera go left and right and roll makes our camera roll from side to side. Here are the final numbers that I came up with. I chose location amplitude multiplier and location frequency multiplier, a value of 0.25, my rotation amplitude multiplier, a value of 0.1, my pitch amplitude, a value of 0.5, my yaw amplitude, a value of 0.5, and my roll, I kept the same. I'll now press compile, and we are done with our camera shake. Now, generally, this step in the process is where you would add wind to your foliage. You can add wind to the plants that you made in Speedtree, but you'll need this specific console command, which I will leave in the description down below. However, in my tests, I have been unable to make the world position offset wind that is built into the Quixel master material work with the path tracer. So for this scene, I will not be animating the Quixel grass because at this point in time, I do not know how to make it correctly work. On that note, it's time to render out our scene. And for this step, I'm gonna use the movie render queue. I'm going to click on this icon right here, which will then open up my movie render queue. I'll then click on unsaved config, and here we can start adding in the needed settings for our render. For my image setting, I'm going to go with JPEG. I'm going to delete deferred rendering and instead add path tracer. Next, I'm going to add my anti-aliasing. And when your rendering mode is set to path tracer, the anti-aliasing tells the path tracer how many render samples there will be. Now, the way that I'm going to test how many samples I need for this environment is I'm going to simply toggle on my path tracer, 
go over to my post process volume, type in path tracer, and see exactly how many samples I need. So I've decided that this scene needs about 750 samples in order to look clean. So to get 750 samples for my scene, I'm gonna turn my spatial sample count to 15 and my temporal sample count to 50. I'm then gonna check override anti-aliasing and leave anti-aliasing method to none. Lastly, I'm gonna add a game override. And now what this game override does is it overrides LODs and replaces all of them with the highest LOD. It uses high quality shadows, which in our case, I don't believe is needed because we're using the path tracer. This game overrides is more so suited for real time rendering. However, I still include it with my path tracer settings because I don't believe that it hurts anything. Lastly, I'm gonna to go to output. I'm gonna leave my file format sequence name to default. My output resolution, I'm gonna leave at HD. You can render this out at 4K. However, keep in mind that it's gonna take quite a while in order to render it. I'm gonna uncheck override existing output and everything else I'm gonna leave default. Lastly, I'm gonna choose my output directory and then after that, I'm going to click accept and render local. Once our frames have been rendered, it's time to bring them into DaVinci Resolve for our final step, color grading. I'm gonna navigate over to the color tab and I'm gonna create two nodes. The first node I'm gonna name exposure and I'm gonna go under my lift, gamma, and gain and tweak the values until I get something that I like. For this scene, I'm going for something with a bit more contrast and a bit more punch. Once happy with that, I'm gonna name my second node, colors. Now there are two things that I wanna change in this scene. I wanna make the sky a bit more saturated, so I'm gonna go under my hue versus saturation and increase the saturation of my sky ever so slightly. Next, going under my hue versus hue, I'm gonna select my grasses and make them a tiny bit more orange. Next, I'm going to go into my effects library and search chromatic aberration removal. This node allows you to add chromatic aberration to your video. Now I'm gonna keep the values very, very low here because I want it to be a very subtle effect. There's nothing worse than seeing a CG render with chromatic aberration all over it. It needs to be a very subtle effect. And my last step is going to be adding a little bit of vignette. Now, of course, you can add vignette in Unreal Engine. However, I prefer to keep it in DaVinci Resolve because I have a bit more control over the vignette. Again, this effect I'm going to keep very subtle with a value of 0 0.05. And that looks good. Thanks everyone so much for watching this video. It was my first video uploaded on this YouTube channel and I am super stoked with how it turned out. I hope you guys learned something, and if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Until next time, cheers.